Good morning, folks. Welcome to our topics class. Once again, we're continuing on in our study with present truth. If you, um, uh, if you did not get a note sheet for today's lesson, it's number 11 back there on the table as you come in. If uh, you didn't get one, uh, if you hold up your hand, someone will see that you do have one. Everybody have one? Okay, very good. Let's have prayer together and then we'll get into the scriptures. Heavenly Father, we do thank and praise you now. Thank you so much, Lord, for your precious word. Lord, we pray that as we study it together, that we might rightly divide the word of truth and see these precious Bible truths contained therein. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, the word of God. And Lord, we would not know who you were without the revelation of yourself to man. And Lord, we pray that we might always treat the Word of God reverently and uh, with holiness, Lord, because it is your revealed Word. You've said you would exalt your Word above your very name. And Lord, we do thank you for this divine revelation that you've given to us. So bless us as we study it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in 2 Peter 1.12, Peter was very concerned that those... Uh, of his flock were, would be established in the present truth, he said, Second Peter 1.12. So Peter's goal was that his flock be established in the present truth. And that would, I guess you could say, that would be my goal too, that, that everyone in this class be established in the present truth. And we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount, and the Sermon on the Mount is not present truth. It is kingdom truth. And we've been going through a number of things uh, concerning the Sermon on the Mount. We have seen the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, and we have saw how that it does not fit into the church age. There's some things in there, if you recall, we went through them one by one, and uh, they, uh, they, don't, they don't dovetail with revealed uh, church truth. Then we saw the Sermon on the Mount and the Lord's Prayer, and as we studied that, we saw pretty much the same thing, even though Christians are using it, reciting it over and over again. Jesus said not to pray in vain repetition. And then last week, we saw the Sermon on the Mount and the Law of Moses, and we saw that Jesus took the Old Testament law, which no Jew could keep, or ever did keep, and he updated it, and uh, updated it to such a degree that uh, a law that they couldn't keep previously, no way could be kept today. But it will be kept during the kingdom age. The Sermon on the Mount is the constitution of the future kingdom. And that kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, is an earthly kingdom. If you're not familiar with that, there are some that teach we're into the kingdom age already. Nothing could be farther from the truth. During the kingdom age, there's not going to be any wars. The nations will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That's not today. During the kingdom age, there will be no carnivorous animals. The lion will eat straw like the oxen. The wolf and the lamb will lay down together and so forth. That's not today. The, uh, the lifespan of humanity, will, the Bible says, will be as the days of a tree. We're certainly not there at, at this point. Our lifespan today is three score and ten and sometimes four score and maybe a little beyond that. But at any rate, this, this is not the kingdom as some are teaching. We belong to the kingdom of God. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We belong to the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of heaven is the earthly kingdom right here upon this earth. And that is still a future prophetic event. We have a name for it. It's not a Bible name, but we call it the millennium because it's a thousand year kingdom. It has not happened yet. Well, today we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount and your money. You know... There are some Christians that get mad when you talk about money or <clears throat> tithing. You don't believe me, ask Pastor Jim. 
As a matter of fact, he talked about it in, in today's sermon, the 815 service. He talked somewhat about, about uh, he didn't mention tithing, but he, did talk, he talked about giving. Some people get really, really mad when you preach about tithing. I remember one of the pastors of this church a number of years ago preached the sermon on tithing, and boy, he got all kinds of feedback from that. None of it good. Uh, people, some people were really, really mad. I have to kind of think those people that got so mad were people that aren't tithers. Uh, a, tither, a real tither wouldn't have gotten mad at it. But if you are one of those people that get mad when you hear about tithing, you're probably going to go ballistic today. <laughs> <laughs> because what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount goes way, 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 way beyond 10% tithing. And so we're going to look into today the Sermon on the Mount and your money. Now, throughout this series, we have shown that the Sermon on the Mount was not given to the church, it was not given to the Gentiles, and it is not being lived out by people, anybody in the world today, whether they're Jews, Christians, or Gentiles. The Sermon on the Mount is kingdom truth and not church truth. And as we have said over and over again in this series, it is the constitution of the kingdom. This is what life is going to be like. These are going to be the rules and regulations of life here in the kingdom. Well, today we're going to hit the high point of it, your money. What did Jesus have to say in the Sermon on the Mount about your money? Now, all of those people who teach about the Sermon on the Mount, the Calvinists and the liberals and a bunch of misinformed Baptists and so forth, at this point right here is when they all abandon ship. They all abandon the Sermon on the Mount. They, they may tell you, oh, you got to live by the Beatitudes, you got to live by the Lord's Prayer, you got to do this, that, and the other thing. But when it comes to the money part here, it's like rats leaving a sinking ship. <laughs> Out they go. They want no part of it. And I'm, I was thinking uh, yesterday, I should have started this series out with this, with this <laughs> lesson right away. It would save a lot of trouble. But at any rate, um, this is what we're, what we're going to look at. We're going to look at five facts about money that are taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And if anyone thinks that this is where we're at today, you're welcome to it. But I'm sure you'll agree that that's just not so. The first one we're going to look at is Matthew 5.42. Jesus said, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. You hear what that's saying? Somebody comes up and asks you for money, give it to them. If somebody comes up and wants to borrow money from you, if you've got it, give it to them, loan it to them. That, these are two specific kingdom truths concerning money. Give to him that asketh of thee, and to him that would borrow, turn not away. Notice there's no conditions involved with this at all. Maybe the person doesn't have a job. Maybe he's just a plain, lazy person. Doesn't say anything about that. It simply says, if give to him that asketh thee, and him that would borrow, turn, turn not away. Okay? So, if you are a non-dispensationalist, my non-dispensationalist friend, do you take this, this verse literally? We're going to see a few more. But do you take that literally? Uh, I would be very surprised if you do. Now, I know you can twist scripture to make it say what you want it to say, but all the twisting in the world the, the, isn't going to help here. Jesus said, Give to him that asketh thee, and, and to him that would borrow of thee, turn not away, and he makes no, it involves no conditions at all. Now, this is going to be step one. When all of those unsecured loans, mortgages, the Fannie Mae, the Freddie Mac thing, uh, loaning money, giving mortgages to people that could not possibly pay them, caused the government to, to, to step in. And this mess, we are in a mess 
this mess that we are in today. This was the very root of it. If they come to borrow, don't turn them away. Give them, give them the loan. This is the policy that bankrupt our government. And secondly, this is the policy that bankrupted the early church back there in the first century, the church at Jerusalem. And thirdly, this is the policy that will bankrupt you if you try to, to, to live by it. Uh, I used to spend many years when I was younger, many years down in the uh, inner city of Detroit, down in the Skid Road and so forth, and you're constantly being asked for money. People want money all the time. I was very glad we're not living by the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, uh, you know, you, you, they, they never cease. They, they see you and they, they know you're a Christian. They figure uh, that you should give them money. Well, this is for the kingdom. That Matthew 5.42 isn't going to work today in the church age, but it will work perfectly in the kingdom. Okay, let's go to step two. Here's step two now. In Matthew 6, 12, Jesus taught his followers to pray, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Oh, okay. Now what we actually have here, if you think back to the 25th chapter of Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 25, Israel was told by God to celebrate every 50 years a jubilee year. And if you're not familiar with the Jubilee year, every 50 years all debts were canceled and all property reverted back to the original owner. If you bought property, let's say you bought a house from somebody, the price you paid for that house would be determined by how many more years could you live in it before the Jubilee, because when the Jubilee year comes, you've got to give it back. That, that was the law of the land back then. Well, that only happened once every 50 years. All those debts were, were, were canceled out. But Jesus is teaching here, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. Well, he said, if anyone borrows from you, don't turn him away. <laughs> and now here's the escape clause. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors this policy would bankrupt a nation or an individual if it, was, if it was used today. It would only work in the perfect government of God here upon the earth. Pardon me. Thirdly, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32 and 33, Here's another principle from the Sermon on the Mount. Luke 12 is not the Sermon on the Mount, but here's one of the principles taught there. Jesus said, Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He's going to give you the kingdom. Who is he talking to? Israel. The kingdom was for Israel. The kingdom was Israel as the head nation, Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords, ruling the, the whole world with the, uh, with the rod of iron. And he says, a uh, little flock here, he says, God will give you the kingdom. And look at the very next phrase. Sell that you have and give alms. Sell what you have, sell all that you have, and give alms. Give your money away. Anybody ever uh, uh, practicing that today? I would doubt it very much. Now, I know there's, there's we, a lot of Christians are good tithers. That's only 10%. The kingdom wants 100%. I mean, 10%. A lot of Christians say, I can't afford to give 10%. What are you going to do in the kingdom? <laughs> it's 100%. Sell it, all that you have and give and give it all away, basically, is, is what, he, what he's saying here. Now, the parallel passage in Luke, there's two of them in, in the Gospel of Luke here. In, in Luke 18, it says, uh, sell all that you have and give it away. Uh, this is what Jesus is talking in Luke 18. He's talking to the, to the rich young ruler. And he says, good master, the rich young ruler says, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And we have the same thing here in Matthew chapter 19, the rich young ruler. Jesus answered to him, As if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. 
He says you've got to get rid of all of your wealth and give it to the poor. Now in Luke, going back to Luke 18 here, in uh, verse 22 there, Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and, and the way Luke records it is distribute unto the poor. So here we have sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. Well, if you did that for very long, there wouldn't be much, anything left to distribute. So this, we, we know here this is kingdom truth. You don't know anybody that has done this, and, the, and neither do I. Well, continuing on in, in Luke 18 there, the 23rd verse, And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Well, folks, don't tell me that you're living by the Sermon on the Mount until you've sold everything that you have and have given it to the poor. That, that's what Jesus is teaching here. It is so obvious this could not possibly be today. It's in that, the kingdom economy. And we're going to nail it down right at the end of the lesson here for you. But um, it, it, it would just, just could not work today. In the kingdom, from these scriptures we, we surmise, in the kingdom there's not going to be rich men. You say, how do we know that? Well, from the scriptures that we have just seen, plus how about this one? Luke 18, 25. For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Doesn't say the rich man can't enter into heaven. In the church, there are, have been down through the ages and will probably continue to be a number of rich men. Some of them have uh, done good with their money. Some have not. But riches will not keep a person out of heaven. Riches would keep a person out of the kingdom. He said it would be easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Why do you suppose that is? It's because they have not obeyed Matthew 5.42. Sell what you have and distribute it, distribute it to the poor. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, going right to the bottom of the page there, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is money. That's what it means. You can't serve God and wealth at the same time. And then he goes on and says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? This is kingdom teaching here. So, he says, don't worry about food. Don't worry about where your food's going to come from. And then he goes on and says, and don't worry about something to drink. And then thirdly, fourthly, he says, don't worry about your clothes. Where are you going to get your clothing from? Well, if you've sold everything, given everything away, the next step is who, who, who's going to take care of me? Uh, how, how am I going to eat and, and drink and have clothes and everything? He says, God will take care of it. This is kingdom truth does not work today. It is not given to the church. It is given to Israel and their future, uh, future kingdom. All right, let's, let's continue on. Um, but before we continue on, turn with me, please, to 1 Timothy 5.8. Just for cl to clarify this, I want to show you church truth concerning this subject. 1 Timothy 5.8. Uh, notice, notice the difference here. You know, people say, oh, there's contradictions in the Bible. Well, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, yeah, there is contradictions in the Bible. But if you study the word of God and rightly divide the word of truth, there are no, no contradictions. What God said to one group of people in one particular age or dispensation does not always necessarily apply in another one. Well, 1 Timothy 5.8, what does he say? If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, 
He hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. What is he saying? He says you go out and you work and you provide for your family. You provide for your loved ones. And if you don't do that, you're worse than an infidel. You've denied the faith. That's strong language. That's church truth, folks. That's not kingdom truth. In kingdom truth, he's saying just exactly the opposite. Don't worry where your food and, and clothes and, and substance are to come from. He says, God, God will take care of you. That's not what we read in the church epistles. It says you go out and you provide. You're the provider. You provide for your family and those in your own household. And if you don't do it, you've denied the faith and are actually worse than, uh, worse than, an, uh, than an individual. All right, let's go to the next page here. Matthew chapter 6, verse 28, 30, and 31. Kingdom truth. Why take ye thought for raiment? In other words, clothing. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which, is to, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, o, of, o ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? That's kingdom truth, church truth. Provide for your own. Take care of your own family. All right, here's number four. This is the fourth fact about money in the kingdom. Matthew 6, 19, 20, and 24. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, which neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Don't worry about tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things itself. Sufficient unto the day, is the evil thereof. Jesus is, tells them there, don't plan your future. Don't prov uh, worry about providing for your, your friends and your loved ones, your, your family and your loved ones and so forth. He says, take no thought for tomorrow. Well, what about retirement? What about old age? What about sickness? I should have some insurance, some health insurance. What about life insurance for if I die and, and my, my family is in need there? Well, here again, Jesus said, don't worry about it. It'll t God will take care of it. That's, that's, all you got, that's all you got to worry about. Well, you contrast this with what Paul said concerning the church. First of all, in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, he says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Contrast that with Matthew 6, 25. Where if they ask of thee, uh, you know, if they ask you, give them money. If they want to borrow money, don't turn them away. What does he say here? If any man would not work, let him not eat. He's not teaching what Jesus taught here. Now, how can you explain that? Jesus teaching one thing, Paul's teaching something else. Jesus is teaching the kingdom to the nation of Israel. Paul is teaching church truth to the church in the age of the grace of God in which we are living today. Two totally different concepts altogether. And then, with scripture we already looked at, 1 Timothy 5.8. If any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and uh, is worse than an infidel. So we read here that the kingdom teaching is you don't have to save money. You don't have to plan for retirement. You don't have to buy insurance. That's, king, that's kingdom truth. Church truth is exactly the opposite. Work or else don't expect to eat and provide for your family and thirdly if you don't you have de you have denied the faith it's to a total opposite and why is it so few people can can uh, can see this now let's continue on with the message of the kingdom what was the message of the kingdom that jesus taught it's not the gospel of the grace of god christ died for our sins he was buried and he rose again 
That's the gospel of the grace of God. The message of the kingdom was a totally different message. Let's look at it. Number one, the kingdom was at hand. Back there in the first century, the kingdom was at hand. Matthew 3, 2, John the Baptist comes saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus is offering the kingdom to Israel. Secondly, he tells them, Seek the kingdom. Luke chapter 12, verse 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Why did he tell them to seek the kingdom? Because the kingdom was at hand. It was at hand. The king had arrived. He's offering the kingdom to Israel. All they had to do was accept it. Thirdly, he tells them if they do that, the Father will give you the kingdom. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is in your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Who's he talking to here? He's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the nation of Israel. It's your Father will give you the kingdom. Fourthly, he says, sell all that you have and give alms. Luke 12, 33, which we, we have already seen that. Sell what you have and give, give alms. That's, that's what they're to do in the kingdom. They're to dispose of all personal property and, um, and give to those that are in need. Uh, fifthly, the future rulers of the kingdom. Jesus even identifies them for us. Matthew 19 and verse 28. Jesus, uh, he's talking to the 12 apostles here. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He's talking to the twelve apostles there. He said, in the kingdom, there's going to be the throne of David. Jesus will occupy the throne of David. He will be king of kings and lord of lords. But he will have twelve other thrones that will be occupied by the twelve apostles of the Lamb, and they will be judging, you notice it says, the twelve tribes of Israel. That certainly is not happening today. That's future. That's kingdom. And then he finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. And look at the result. Matthew 7, verse 28. It came to pass... When Jesus had ended these things, that the people were astonished at his doctrine. Just like some of you are astonished <laughs> when we've been teaching some of these things. They were astonished at his doctrine. Because these things that he is teaching, what he taught here in the Sermon on the Mount, they don't work today, they will work. They will work perfectly in the future kingdom age. Now, we're going to get into the meat of this right now. Fast forward to the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is when the church began. Okay? Ba this is basic truth that we must realize that the kingdom offer was still a valid offer when the book of Acts began. Let me say it again. You must realize that the kingdom offer was still a valid offer when the book of Acts began. The offer of the kingdom to Israel was still on the table. Now before we get into the meat of this, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, to first of all, to the book of Acts chapter 3. The book of Acts chapter 3. I want to show you that the offer of the kingdom was still valid. It had not been withdrawn at this point. Pentecost is in Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at Acts chapter 3. And we're going to look at starting with verse 19. Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, Peter is preaching to the Jews here. And he says in verse 19, Repent ye therefore and be converted. He says you need to be converted here. That your sins may be blotted out. When, will the, when, is, this talk, when is he talking about? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Well, that times of refreshing is the kingdom age. He says you need to repent and have your sins blotted out 
to, uh, in order to uh, enter into, into the kingdom here, the times of refreshing from the Lord. Verse 20, what's going to happen if they do repent? Verse 20, and, it, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. He says, if you do that, see the offer is still on the table there. He says, if you do that, Jesus Christ will come back. God will send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. The second coming of Christ could have taken place back there in the first century if Israel had repented of what they had done and had accepted Christ. But, of course, we know that did, did not happen. But the offer is there. Uh, he will, if you repent and, he, and accept him, Jesus will come back and he will set up his kingdom. That's what he's going to do when he does come back. He's going to set up his kingdom. But it could have been way back there in the first century. Verse 21, whom the heavens must receive, talking about Jesus, how long must the heavens receive Jesus? Remember, he was caught up to heaven. He was re the Bible says he was received up into heaven. It says, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things. The restitution of all things. Another name for the kingdom, the millennium. The restitution of of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. The church was a secret, kept secret from the foundation of the world, but the kingdom was spoken by all of God's holy prophets since the world began. And here is the, it's called the time of restitution of all things. That's when all wrongs are going to be made right. That's when all of the nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That is when the, um, they will learn of war no more. That is when the animals will become non-carnivorous. That is when the lifespan is going to revert back to almost a thousand years like it was back there before the flood. All of these things are, are going to take place when King Jesus is, is on the throne. All things, well, that will be the, it'll be the time of restitution of all things. I'll revert back as it was intended by God before the fall of man. Okay, so that is the offer of the kingdom in Acts chapter 3. The offer was still valid. It was still on the table. Now go with me to Acts chapter 7. This offer of the kingdom was continued until the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. God still is offering the kingdom to Israel. But we come to Acts chapter 7, and here's where the offer is going to be withdrawn. Now you remember, in Acts chapter 3, verse 20, Peter says, if you will repent, he will send Jesus Christ back. Right? That's what he said in Acts 3.20. Okay? In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is preaching, and he comes to the end of his sermon in verse, um, uh, verse 54. It says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed on him with their teeth. They're gonna, this is the final offer, and they're going to reject it. Okay, Verse 55, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and what did he see? He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And the next verse he says, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Why is Jesus standing? He's not supposed to be standing. He's supposed to be sitting at the right hand of God. Psalm 110, verse 1, sit, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. That hasn't happened yet, and so Jesus is supposed to be sitting. Why is he standing here in Acts chapter 7? This is the final offer of the kingdom, and he's standing to return, just like it said in Acts 3.20. If you will repent, he will send Jesus Christ back to you, and you can have the kingdom. And Jesus stands to return, but instead they stone Stephen, the offer is rejected for the final time. Jesus sits back down at this very moment in heaven. He is seated 
at the right hand of God the Father until he comes back again. He stands up to return, which he will do one of, the, one of these days. Okay? So this is the, the, uh, the valid offer of the kingdom. In the, in the early chapter of Acts, first seven chapters of Acts, the kingdom offer was still on the table. Now, having said all that, this is what, that, that's what you have to realize to understand this, these next passages we're going to look at. One is from Acts chapter 2 and the other is from Acts chapter 4. Okay, in Acts chapter 2, verse 44 and 45. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Why did they do that? They were practicing the Sermon on the Mount. See that? They're doing what Jesus told them to do on the Sermon on the Mount. They had all things common. They sold their possessions. They parted their goods and distributed to every man as he had a need. And then we go to Acts chapter 4, verse 34 and 35, and we read it again. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Distribution was made to every man as he, as he had need. Okay, so they were practicing what Jesus had taught them in the kingdom. And it, notice it says, Neither was there any among them that lacked. Things were going good. Why? Because the offer of the kingdom was still a valid offer. It had not yet been withdrawn. It wasn't withdrawn till Acts chapter 7. So what they were doing is they were practicing the Sermon on the Mount. They were living and practicing the Sermon on the Mount. They were responding to the offer of the kingdom. And that's why, as we already saw there from Acts 3, 19 and 20, Peter said, Repent, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. And that's exactly what they, what they were doing, and continued to do until, uh, well, continued to do even beyond Acts 7, but in Acts chapter 7, the final offer and the final rejection are recorded for us in the scripture. And the kingdom program, from that point on, no longer worked. And the Jewish saints in Jerusalem were left destitute. That socialistic program that they embarked upon, it worked well as long as the kingdom was being offered to them. But when it was rejected, bankruptcy, bankruptcy set in very, very fast. Now, the Apostle Paul, uh, uh, by the way, before I mention that, no Gentile churches practiced that, what we just read there in Acts. It was just strictly the Jewish church in Jerusalem. That's the only one. Because the kingdom was offered to the Jews, to the nation Israel. So they were the only one that practiced that. Now the Apostle Paul, he was apostle to the Gentiles. And he goes out and he plants Gentile churches all over Asia Minor and Europe. And he goes to those churches, those Gentile churches, to raise money to ship back to Jerusalem to those destitute Jewish Christians that had given all their money away when the kingdom offer had been withdrawn. Look with me. Romans chapter 15, verse 26. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Acacia, that's Gentile churches, to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. How did they get to be poor? They were practicing the Sermon on the Mount and money, what Jesus said about money. When the offer was withdrawn, they just kept right on doing that, and they went bankrupt. 
They're called the poor saints, which are at Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians 16.1. Now concerning the collection for the saints. That was to send to the saints there at Jerusalem. Acts 11, verse 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. That's where Jerusalem is, in Judea. And so... Paul raises money. You read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, you read a whole lot about that offering that he was taking up for the express purpose of relieving those bankrupt Christians. They had sold everything and they had given everything away. Now, Acts chapter 5. You ever hear of Ananias and Sapphira? <clears throat> this is what the, at the time when they lived. And notice there the first two verses of Acts 5. A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. That's what Jesus said to do. And then it says they kept back part of the price. That's what Jesus said not to do. And his wife also, being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Why did the early church embark upon socialism because they learned it from the Sermon on the Mount. They were obeying the Sermon on the Mount. So in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, they would still be alive if it wasn't for that kingdom truth. Stop and think what they did. What did they actually do? They had a piece of property that they sold. They, they sold that property, and they came and they gave a good percent to the church. Now, it doesn't tell us how much they gave, but it was obviously a lot more than 10% because they wanted everybody to think they were giving 100%. And so they gave a huge amount to the church. And what happened to them? God zapped both of them. You know, we had a family in our church a few, few years ago. Uh, they came into a lot of money from a lawsuit. And um, uh, when they got that money, right away they set aside, I don't know if it was 10%, might have been more than 10%, but they set that aside to give to God, which, is a bibl which they were doing a biblical thing. And they gave that money to God. If they had been living during the kingdom economy here in the early chapters of Acts, they would have gone the way of Ananias and Sapphira. Because Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, you give all, you give everything. Well, Ananias and Sapphira, they probably gave 50, 60, 70 percent of that money that they had. Whatever it was, they didn't give all of it, and they were zapped by God. So the, um, uh, the, in, in the, uh, the, the case before them here is, had they done that, just a few years later, they would, it would have been very commendable. They, oh, they, they sold, sold this property. Look at all the money they gave to the church. Would have been a very commendable thing. They probably would have been hailed in the church as, as wonderful Christian people, given all that money. But under the kingdom economy, it was 100%. Isn't it interesting? Under the Old Testament law, God says you give 10%. During the church age, he doesn't necessarily say 10%, but he says to give generously because God loves a cheerful giver. But under the kingdom, it's 100%. It's 100%. So here we have, here we have the difference in giving in the, in the uh, dispensation of the kingdom. Certainly does not apply to the church. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 and 19, through 19. Paul says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. There's no rich man in the kingdom. They had to give it all away. He's talking to the church here. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute and willing to communicate. That word communicate means share. Ready to distribute, ready to share. And so he, he, he talks about rich men in the church. He says it's okay to have money. Just don't let the money have you. But in the kingdom, you have a totally different 
um, standard here altogether. Well, if you can sift through those verses about the kingdom and the giving of money and still think that that is, that is applicable for today, um, i like to see you afterwards. I could uh, use a little cash. Christmas is coming. <laughs> okay, let's look to God in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you now for the Word of God and, and the, the Spirit of God, our teacher. And Lord, we would pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, Lord, that we might go rejoicing in the good things of God and that we might be good givers. Lord, we know you don't expect us to be giving 100% like you taught Israel during the Kingdom Age, but Lord, help us to give cheerfully and uh, to give uh, to the glory of God. Now bless us in all things, Lord, and bless in the class to follow, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.